Um, so <coughs> today we are um, starting discussion on um, strain hardening. Um, so when form a piece of uh, steel, if you've ever done this in a um, uh, uniaxial tensile machine, you, you've noticed that once you pass the, the yield point, um, the machine has to apply a ever-increasing uh, force to uh, continue deforming the material. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the basic process that's behind that is we uh, generate dislocations um, at a very high rate, lots of them, and um, these dislocations uh, prevent each other from uh, moving freely. And so as the dislocation density increases, we also get increasingly uh, stronger obstacle effects from dislocations on other dislocations. And um, both the distribution, spatial distribution of the dislocations um, and their density evolves during the straining. Okay? And so we'll try to understand this um, in, in the course of these lectures and try to see, um, you know, can we develop equations that will allow us to basically um, compute stress strain curves in practice. So, so first of all, you can always compute stress strain curves if you have data on the material. Hmm? Um, so we've already talked about the uh, Holloman power law. Hmm? Sigma is a constant times epsilon to the power n. And um, that's basically what you get from a, a stress strain curve. And if somebody's done the test and tells you what n and a are, you can basically um, recover um, the stress strain curve. Hmm? And um, in engineering uh, talk, yes, we, this factor n, that's what we call the strain hardening, yes? Um, and, and that contains all these physical processes, complex physical processes that I've just talked about. In engineering, of course, this factor is very important, and uh, we have standards to determine them, yes? And, uh, and it's just, you know, this is, for instance, according to this uh, ASTM standard, how you compute n. Yes, you, you just don't do your own thing. You have to do it. Uh, and, and there are different standards. Uh, but anyway, uh, whenever it's computed, you get it from your machine. Yes, it's, it's computed over a specific length of the stress strain curve. Yes, and, um, and for a number of discrete stress strain values. Hmm? So, and, and this is one of these examples. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but but that's, that's how you do it. You, you, you measure discrete points on this curve. And uh, for instance, five points here between 10 and 20%. And that's how you compute the, the engineering value of the, stress strain, uh, of the strain hardening. Yes? Right. And um, another thing this, that I want to uh, repeat, I think I've said it earlier, hmm, is that this n value certainly in uh, introductory materials mechanics uh, lectures is often related to plastic instability hmm, because uh, you just uh, use, combine the consider criterion for plastic instability with the Holloman power law, yes? And if you do that, the uh, consider criterion says that the, you get uh, the end of uniform elongation, the start of necking, when the derivative to, of the stress strain curve hmm, uh, is equal to the stress. Hmm? So that's this. Uh, so if you have an engineering stress strain curve, that's the, as you know, the maximum in the stress strain curve. Uh, that there's where you have the uh, uniform elongation. So if you apply this 
apply this equation to the Holloman uh, uh, power law, you find that n is equal to the uniform elongation, right? That's a handy way of um, trying to understand or see that there is a relation between strain hardening and uniform elongation. Yes, it's, that's why it's an interesting uh, thing to remember. But using it in practice may not, is definitely not uh, something you, you should do, right? It's not the way you determine the strain hardening of a material. You know, um, by, by, by determining the maximum of the stress, engineering stress strain curve and then recalculating that strain in terms of uh, true strain, yes? Uh, if you do that, you, you find that, uh, so if you put the uniform strain here, and the strain hardening ex exponent there, you, you, you clearly see that um, uh, if you do this in practice, you, know, you make measurements, that the uniform elongation is not equal to the strain hardening, yes? So um, don't use it for, um, to determine strain hardening coefficients. Having said this, it's something important to remember because it basically tells you that Having a high strain hardening, yes, gives you large uniform elongations, yes? And, of course, if you want to have a very plastic material, yes, uh, that means you'll have to work on the strain hardening. Alternatively, if you have a certain material that doesn't have much elongation, you know that the problem is, has something to do with the way the material strain hardens. Yes? Okay? Good. So, oh, that's odd. Doesn't seem to be diversion. I have. Could you just, just give me a second here because that's not the version I wanted to use. I'll just be back in five minutes.
sorry about that. And added a few things at the uh, and there we go. Yes. Yes, that's a bit better. I added a few things at the introduction and kind of okay. So um, when, when we um, uh, uh, wrapped up last week, I said uh, we were going to talk about strain hardening, and um, and I also um, emphasized the fact that uh, you know, strain hardening is important, and uh, you know we we, uh, we we we're studying it uh, as a strengthening mechanism. Uh, but it's not very often used as a strengthening mechanism in practice. And, and there is, um, and, and the reason is very simple. If you, if you s y use strain hardening to get a stronger material, which you can do, you know, um, you of course have reduced amount of plastic deformation potential left. And so there are not many products uh, steel products that are actually produced, which um, which use strain hardening as a way to uh, to strengthen material. But a very uh, you know well known uh, product, corrugated, galvanized uh, roofing sheet is is an exception to this rule. The stiffness and the hardness of this material is is obtained by uh, basically plastic deformation. But once you have this product, you obviously you don't deform it anymore, so you don't really care about the fact that there is a reduced plastic deformation range um, in this material. Hmm? But it's a very cheap way of making, you know, of getting strong steel. Okay? So this we, we discussed just now. Right, so um, I do want to say that again, uh, it depends very much on the crystallography of uh, your steel, what the strain hardening will be. Hmm? And, and there is a, a very pronounced difference between the strain hardening of uh, austenitic steels and ferritic steels. So ferritic steels, this is an example here, very nice example, where we compare two stainless steels. Hmm? Uh, one has a ferritic microstructure, the other one has an austenitic microstructure, and uh, the up, I mean the difference is very obvious, right? Um, you can see that the austenitic steel has a huge uh, uniform elongation in comparison to the ferritic steel. So the uniform elongation for ferritic steel would be here, a little less than 20%, um, because this engineering stress strain curve, and the uh, austenitic steel has, what, three times that amount of uniform elongation. And uh, the, re the reason for this is basically the difference in strain hardening behavior. You can see strain hardening behavior of ferritic steel compared to the strain hardening behavior of the austenitic steel. For uh, uh, you, uh, uh, if there are any students who are involved, do, do, do research on austenitic steels, um, or FCC uh, steels, uh, this particular grade, the 304 uh, austenitic steel, doesn't, there is no martensitic transformation involved. It is purely strain hardening, increase of the dislocation density as you deform. And uh, if you uh, do these tests in a uh, universal tensile testing machine, you will find that uh, the N value is indeed much larger for an austenitic steel than for a ferritic steel, and it's about double the amount. Hmm? All right. So, and 
this has nothing to do with you know uh, special little things in the microstructure or anything. You know, or, you know, doing stuff with the grain boundaries or putting precipitate. This is purely dislocation related. So you see, if you t if you look at single crystals of these alloys, you know, single crystal of a uh, of, of uh, BCC iron, and you compare with single crystals of uh, FCC, austenitic alloys, you see the same thing. A very pronounced difference in strain hardening with the austenitic uh, structure, crystal structure, giving you a lot more strain hardening than the ferritic uh, microstructure. Hmm? So it's, it's nothing to do with, you know, with, with the, the, uh, the microstructure. It's got everything to do with the dislocations, the way they uh, uh, evolve uh, during straining in terms of uh, their distribution and in terms of their density. Hmm? Okay. You can uh, look at this, uh, the evolution of the uh, dislocation density. You can just uh, uh, you know, take a pure alpha iron single crystal hmm, and um, strain it. Uh, cut slices out of this single crystal and look into the microstructure um, to determine the uh, dislocation density, for instance, uh, by direct observation using TM or by using indirect methods such as x ray diffraction. You hmm? also could use to measure dislocation density by looking at uh, uh, peak broadening. And this, these are typical values you get. Uh, Well-annealed uh, crystal, grains of ferrite or, or of single crystal, will give you somewhere between 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 12 uh, dislocations per square meters as density. And as you strain, this is a test in compression. So th basically, uh, you take the single crystal and you just roll it you know, in, a, in, a, in a laboratory uh, mill. Yes. And you measure the dislocation density, and you find that, interestingly enough, you get a very, initially a very strong increase in the dislocation density. And then what happens is the dislocation density reaches a saturation value. Yes? There is some kind of apparent maximum value of dislocations that you get in the structure. Hmm? And, um, and this is a lot of deformation, right? You can see. Uh, 60, 80, 90 percent of compression, right? It's a serious amount of compression, yes? Um, the other thing that's interesting is that that saturation value at around um, two to three times, in this case, uh, so for this particular value, single crystals, 10 to the 15th per square meters of dislocation density, is close to the dislocation density you get in martensite. Yeah? You can see that's the dislocation that you can take a, uh, you know, make a thermal treatment of a steel. Hmm? And again, uh, by extra diffraction or by direct observation in the TM, you can measure dislocation density and you obtain values that are very close to the huge dislocation densities you get after extensive plastic deformation. So one of the reasons why martensite is a hard and strong, yes? It, um, this is the second reason why martensites, ferrous martensites, are hard and strong, is because they have a very high density of dislocations. And where do these dislocations come from? Because you just do it thermal treatment. Well, they're a result of the transformation itself. The transformation requires shearing the lattice, yes? And that is this, the shearing uh, is uh, accomplished by transformation dislocations. Transformation, and you get a very high density of those during the uh, martensite, um, ferrous martensite formation. Hmm? Okay. Now, um, the um, uh, uh, explanation for uh, strain hardening. Hmm? Um, 
again, just like in the case of uh, solid solution strengthening, there are different schools of thoughts, yeah? so different, meaning different ideas, different basic theories on the um, formation on the on the uh, yes on, on the formation of strain hardening how does it you know how does it evolve yes and the, the two schools of thoughts one school of thought says well when you deform steels yes you look at the microstructure very quickly you see a patterning a patterning of the dislocations yes and that patterning is described as cell structure formation. Hmm? And so one group of theories says, and it, the basic theory is called the kuhlmann wilsdorf model, they say that's the key to the strain hardening. Yes? And what does this theory say? Well, this theory says that the, uh, the dislocations have a natural yes, um, tendency to form these patterns because they carry so much strain energy around them. So there's lots of lattice straining around this location. So they'll form low energy associations, yes, which are called uh, these cell boundaries. So they'll, they'll, they'll organize themselves in cell structures rather than remain uniformly distributed. So we, are, we already describe this, you know, when you have two parallel edge dislocations, they'd like to form low energy tilt boundaries. Hmm? At 45 degrees if they have of a certain type, or low angle tilt boundaries if they are of another type. So that's, there is this tendency for dislocations to do this. Hmm? Now, this cell structure formation happens, you can already observe it if you, if you look in a TM at, at uh, steels that are not very much, not uh, very strongly deformed, like 4%, 5% of strain, so it's a small amount of strain, you can already see, see the emergence of a cell structure. Hmm? With dislocations are mostly localized in cell walls. Hmm? Yes. And there, so you have uh, concentrated strain dislocations in the uh, cell walls. Hmm? And the dislocation density in these cell walls can be uh, three to five times higher than the, the average dislocation density. Hmm? Hmm? And the volume fraction of these cell walls is you know, 10 to 30 percent of the volume carries a lot of the dislocations. Yeah? The result is that the size of the cell walls, as, as you increase the dislocation density, the size of the cell walls decreases, yes? And that limits the distance over which dislocations can glide, yes? And that's the key to the strain hardening, yes? Because the, 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 the dimensions over which the dislocation can freely glide decreases steadily, yes? it takes a lot more force, externally applied force, to have the move over these, uh, to, to generate them and have them move across the cell uh, volume. So. And there is a very clear uh, 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 relation between the flow stress hmm, and, and the size of the cell. And in fact, that is actually uh, is considered as the reason why this theory should be right, basically. Hmm? There is, uh, hmm? So dislocation cells are the main agent of strain hardening in this uh, uh, theory because there is a strong uh, relation between flow stress and size of the cell. Hmm? And in fact, so the, slow, the flow stress Ish has been shown to be proportional to the inverse of the cell diameter. Hmm? Okay, and and so so the the flow stress yeah, is proportional to uh, this equation here, and you can um, write it in a more universal way by writing the the flow stress divided by g, the shear stress, is b. Um, 
b divided by d. And d is the, that's the important relation, one over d relation. Hmm? And you see here that uh, for uh, iron alloys here, iron carbon alloy, iron titanium alloys, we get the hardness increasing when we go from one micron cell size yes, to a 50 nanometer cell size. Yeah? A very nice linear relation. Yeah? Okay. I, I, first of all, just for the people who are familiar to Hall-Patch equations, has nothing, this is not related to Hall-Patch relation, right? This is uh, of grain size. Yeah? It's related to this cell formation. So this is what you see inside a grain, yes? Inside the grain, you see that if you make small amounts of deformations, yes, you can see here, this is an, a, a ferritic steel, this is for austenitic steel, you can see that there are regions, yes, of, and there is one big one there, regions which are pretty much empty of dislocations, and then regions where very high dislocation tangles uh, where you have very high dislocation tangles. So this is a cell structure. This is an early cell structure. This is a somewhat later cell structure in an austenitic steel. You can see here it's a, a magnification of this uh, image there. Very high dislocation density in the cell walls and inside the cell, very low dislocation density. Hmm? And so when you deform the material, you basically have dislocation crossing this, this volume, yes? And so the 1 over d, yes, in the, in, on the previous slide, is, is related to the dimensions of this cell, yeah? not the grain size. Okay. So this is one idea, yeah? that dislocation cells, and in particular their dimension, is the main uh, agent of hardening. And how does it work? Well, as you add more dislocations, the cell size decreases. Yes, and that gives you the hardening. Hmm? All right. Now there's another school of thought who says, well, the key thing to strain hardening is the evolution of the dislocation density, period. You don't have to worry about the details of the distribution the spatial distribution of the dislocations. And this theory just says that the strain hardening is caused by forest dislocations, which intersect this, uh, the slip plane of your primary dislocations. Right? So this is a slip plane. I have here these edge dislocations. They move on the slip plane, and there are some forest dislocations which cross, cut, this glide plane, and they will be the obstacles, yes? So I have a, a short-range interaction here, yes? And um, this interaction mm, has an effect on the force I need to move to dislocation and the rate of dislocation storage on the glide plane. Mm. So we'll, we'll come back to this, this concept here of storage of dislocations. Mm. And so um, the, uh, the original form of this model yes, excludes cell formation. There's no talk about cell formation in this model. The only thing that's of importance is the density, the evolution of the dislocation density. Yes? Okay? And this, this is a, a picture here, uh, schematic, and you can see, um, you know, if, if, if you're lucky, you can see uh, in, in TM, for instance, you can see glide dislocations interacting with forest dislocations uh, in, in, in the microstructures, rather common occurrence, yes? Yeah. And so this is the, uh, this model is called the, the Cox mecking estrin model. Uh, and uh, if we go into detail, yes? Um, what does the, that model say um, in terms of dislocation density evolution, right? That's the, that's the big thing. Right? Well, the dislocation density evolution yes, determines the strain hardening. And there are two things that uh, occur. Yes? 
First of all, there is dislocation, creation, and storage. Yes? An increase in the dislocation density when you deform a grain. Yes? Um, these dislocations, when they move in, uh, in the crystals, hmm, their energy can be reduced by reacting to form less energetic dislocations by reaction or by dislocation, uh, other dislocation configuration. You remember we talked about um, uh, these uh, A110 uh, uh, junctions? In, yeah, so that's an example where you have two dislocations that come together and form a third dislocation with a lower B square uh, uh, parameter, right? So that's a reduction of energy. Hmm? Okay, and, and so and, and this way you get you form obstacles. Hmm? So dislocations interact with each other. Yes, you can form obstacles. Yes, and or pinning points if you want, and in order to release that dislocation, you will need to increase the this, this stress, yes? To have a force that's larger than the pinning force working um, on dislocation. So the stress must be increased to remove the junction, yes? Uh, and let the dislocation cross each other, hmm? okay? As I increase the dislocation density, the number of dislocation dislocation interactions will increase, yes? And that's the, the process of strain hardening. The number of interaction point increases as the dislocation density increases. And this leads to uh, a model that very nicely predicts a one a, a square root dependence of the dislo of the, the the flow stress on the dislocation density. So the, the flow stress is proportional to the dislocation density, the square root of that. That's a second. Can we make sense of this square root dependence? First of all, let's have a look at this square root dependence in practice. So if you look at uh, a lot of measurements that have been done on iron, yes, you find indeed that, for instance, if you measure critical resolved shear stress for polycrystals or single crystals, that um, as you basically look at what's the flow stress in materials, that have different amounts of strain, right? and so different amounts of dislocation density. And you plot the stress at which you, the material starts to deform, hmm? or polycrystal, and you plot this as a function of the square root of the dislocation density, you find a pretty good linear relation for polycrystals, and a very nice, clear uh, linear relation for uh, single crystal data. Hmm? And the equation, yes, um, is shown here. The shear st uh, stress is proportional to a basic shear stress that's related to lattice friction, solid solution hardening, etc. Hmm? times a plus, excuse me, a factor which is strain hardening. So it's, we'll, we'll go into the theory in a moment, but uh, this is uh, the way very often the, you also analyze the experimental data. So alpha times G times B, square root of the dislocation density. And the dislocation density is a function of the shear s s strain, right? So the more you, you the larger your shear strain is, the larger your dislocation density, yes? Uh, and, and, and so, in fact, you know that I can relate single crystal data to polycrystalline data simply by multiplying 
the shear stress, shear strain uh, relation with m, the Taylor factor. So I, I multiply this equation with m. This gives me the stress as a function of strain, yes? And this is really interesting if you think about it because it, this is a stress-strain curve, stress as a function of strain. And you see that the only parameter that's strain-dependent here is the dislocation density. Yes? So if you have a way to get to the, to describe the dislocation density evolution with strain, so if you have a way to, to uh, if you have a way to determine the evolution of the dislocation density with strain, yes, you can basically generate a stress-strain curve on basis of this uh, uh, law, as it were. Yeah? Very simple law. Uh, okay. So, uh, so first of all, uh, without going into too much detail at this point, uh, let's try to make sense of this square root dependence. Um, can we make sense of the fact that the flow stress would be dependent on proportional to the square root of the uh, uh, dislocation density. So, so first of all, uh, let's look at um, the uh, Cox-Mackig model, which says dislocations are basically bothered by uh, or experience forest dislocations as obstacles. So let's look at this red dislocation here. Its slip plane is the plane of my projection here. And then it encounters forest dislocations, which are uh, cutting its slip plane, yes? And, and say, for to make things easy yeah, and to make sense of this square root dependence, I will just say that this is a square lattice of um, uh, forest dislocations. Well, if I have a square lattice of forest dislocations, and the dislocation density is uh, rho d, yes, then there will be yes, one dislocation per, one forest dislocation per L square, where L is one over the square root of the dislocation density. I've derived this in a previous uh, lecture. Hmm? Now you'll say, well, isn't that a little bit simplified here? Because you, you only consider one dislocation here, and all the dislocations, all the other dislocations are forest dislocations. Yes, you put every... Well, actually, that's not a bad picture. There are a lot more forest dislocations than there are glide dislocations. Yes? So if you, if you strain the material, yes? And I, I don't think I have, I have the slide a little bit later on in the... In, 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 if you strain the material, you find out that There are two types of dislocation, and you can see it's already from my uh, simplified model here. I have dislocations that move, yes, and dislocations that don't move. Dislocations that act as obstacles, yes, and dislocations that glide, that do the deformation. So I, I have dislocations which are mobile, and I have dislocations that are immobile, yes. And the immobile dislocations are forest dislocations. And it turns out that when you deform materials, yes, very quickly, excuse me, the forest dislocations, growth of forest dislocation density outpaces the growth of the glide dislocation or mobile dislocations by many orders of magnitudes. Yeah. Okay, so um, 
So we know that the distance here uh, between our uh, obstacles, forest dislocations, is 1 over the square root of uh, the dislocation density. So if we go back now to our fundamental equation of, uh, for strengthening, lattice strengthening, we have basically seen that, so we have our forest dislocation points here, intersecting the glide plane. This is this dislocation is trying to pass these obstacles. You know that at breakaway, yes, the, uh, so the, 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 the force of, uh, of the dislocations on the obstacles, yes, so that is 2t cosine critical angle of, or breakaway angle, when this reaches a maximum value, which is the, the force of the maximum force that the obstacle, i.e. the uh, forest dislocation can exert on this moving dislocation, when I reach these conditions, I will have breakaway. Hmm? Now, of course, um, what, what provides the, the force on the dislocation is what you externally apply, right? And that is tau times b times the length of the dislocation segment, okay? So the um, uh, critical, so, so tau times b times l, yes, is equal to f max at breakaway. Hmm? f max is 2 times t times cosine of the critical angle. Okay, and so you see here, yes, that L, the spacing between uh, the uh, two uh, forest dislocation appears in the denominator. So it, if I put it in, I get G times B times the square root of uh, the dislocation density times the numerical factor, which is the critical angle. So I find something that's very similar to this equation, all right? Okay. Good, so uh, one of the uh, uh, question, questions um, uh, that is interesting to ask at, at this point and also partly because it, it was a historic, uh, historically, uh, that's how people started to think about strain hardening. Um, we assume in the cox mecking model that it is these forest dislocations that interact with our um, moving dislocations. But you could also argue and say, well, what about parallel dislocations on, you know, on, on glide planes? Parallel dislocations, two dislocations on the same glide plane. Can't they work as obstacle to each other? Because after all, we know that, uh, you know, they exert uh, forces on each other. For and that leads to the formation of low angle boundaries. Okay. So if you analyze this, yes, this uh, interaction of parallel dislocations, yes, and you, you, for instance, consider uh, uh, this type of uh, configuration here, of dislocations, edge dislocations like this, edge dislocations like this, yes, and uh, you, you want this dislocation to move past each other, you, yes? So, so, so you know that when you have two parallel dislocations, yes, um, there will be a force bit working on. So you will have to exert a force to make them pass over each other to get the deformation, right? So, and that can be, it's been uh, solved by simply looking at what is the force that uh, one of these dislocations exerts on the other one, yes? And that is known. We know 
what this force is. It's in the lecture notes. Uh, it's one of the derivations we made, yes? And uh, so this is the equation. And you can also calculate. You remember we had uh, curves that looked like this. Uh, like this, right? Yes, you can calculate what is the maximum uh, force that one dislocation will exert on the other one as, as you try to pass one over the other, past the other. Yeah? So you can determine what is the maximum force. First, where it, what's the position of the maximum by making the derivative of this force. Hmm? That's where the maximum occurs. And the dislocation can pass each other yes, if the, uh, uh, the applied force is larger than this, this maximum here. So you just um, uh, put this value in this equation, yes? yes. And um, for a certain value of y, certain distance, okay? And, and this is what you find. G, B, um, 8 pi, 1 minus nu times 1 over d. Hmm? And, and here again, you use the fact that you have a perfect square uh, dislocation configuration, hmm? right? So a uh, perfect square dislocation configuration, yes? So that means that um, you have one dislocation in this per uh, d square uh, surface area here, hmm? where d is one over the square root of the dislocation density. Hmm? So if you put this in this, this previous equation here for tau, yes, you have to multiply with m to get the, the stress. And the 1 over d is changed to square root of the dislocation density. Okay, let me go back here. So you get, again, an equation that looks very much like the one we just obtained for interaction of glide dislocation with forest dislocations. And, and if you... Uh, use this equation now, yes, and you put in the parameters that we have, yes, um, uh, for alpha iron, B, G, uh, the uh, Poisson ratio, the M value, you find uh, what alpha is and you find what the stress is as a function of the dislocation density, yes? Okay. And this is what you find. You find this here. You find this equation here. Yes. And if you, you know, experimentally determine the, the stress as a function of the square root of the dislocation density, this is what you find. Yeah. So, yes, you, if you have parallel dislocations interacting, the flow stress will depend on the square root of the dislocation density, but the effect will be very small. Yes. So this tells us that the strain, the hardening, is not due to dislocations moving parallel to each other. It's due to forest dislocations. Yes? Now it's, it's, it's important because the, you know, the if, if we're only parallel dislocations interacting strongly with each other, you would not get obstacles, you know, very sharp obstacles. And all the dislocations would remain mobile, right? And so that's not the case. So we, we, in terms of the hardening effect, we can basically ignore that kind of interaction. We have to look at forest dislocations, all right? So, um, yes, so we, um, so it, 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 as, as we increase the stress, we get a higher dislocation density. So that's, that's basically a bit of the reverse of what I showed. And, and you can look at this for, um, uh, uh, different crystals, yes, so this, this linear relation is uh, very 
strongly pronounced. Okay? So, um, we now have yeah, a relation between uh, stress and dislocation density. Yeah? And the dislocation, and the other thing we know is the dislocation density increases with strain. Okay? So now let's look a little bit um, at uh, what we're doing here. Because we're looking at the dislocations um, at in a in a crystal up to now. We we haven't talked about polycrystal, polycrystalline materials. But when we are interested in steels, we'll have to say, we'll have to make that jump from single crystals to polycrystals. So let's have a look at what happens in single crystal materials. So if you take a single crystal and you orient it very nicely for, for instance, uh, alpha iron, for single uh, slip, yes, you find that as you, as you strain the material, you, you can, you can calculate the shear slip, the amount of shear on the glide plane, right? And this is the, the, the critical resolved shear stress or the flow stress of your crystal. So it's basically a stress strain curve, shear stress, shear strain curve of a single crystal. So we, where does it start to yield at the critical resolved shear stress, right? Around 20 megapascal, all right? So that's, and then we see that the we have a first region of shear stress, shear strain that goes like this. And so a, a small increase. And then we have a strong increase of the uh, slope of the stress strain curve. And then a decrease of the slope of this curve. Yeah? So, so we usually talk about these, uh, this, this, this single crystal behavior in terms of stage one, stage two, and stage three. You don't always see these stages, yes? This is a case where the, the crystal was oriented in such a way that when you started the difference, there's only one slip system activated, yeah? Okay? And so this first, uh, uh, behavior here is what we call easy glide. But what about these two uh, glide uh, 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 hardening behaviors? And what is the relation with a ferritic steel? Well, okay. So let's now schematically plot the derivative to this curve, the strain hardening. The derivative to this curve, which we call theta, capital theta, yes, um, as a function of the stress, right? When we talk about strain hardening, there, we, we very often like to plot not the strain hardening as a function of strain, but also as a function of stress. And we'll see later why that's interesting. It's because we can get nice universal plots when we do this. So strain hardening. So here at the beginning, we have a low strain hardening. Then we go into a very high strain hardening. Yes? And then we go into a steadily, we, I mean, you can't see it here in stage, a steadily reducing strain hardening value. So, for a single crystal behavior, you get this, low strain hardening, very high strain hardening, and then it curves down into a steadily lower strain hardening. Yes? The material st still strain hardens, right? Still takes more force to make the deformation, but the amount you need is, gets lower. Yeah? And if we plot this, on top of the strain hardening behavior for a polycrystalline steel, ferritic steel, we get the, something that looks like this red line. Yes? So if I would try to compare my single crystal data 
strain hardening data with the same material but present as a polycrystalline material, I wouldn't see stage one. I wouldn't see stage two. I'd only see stage three. Yes? So single crystal hardening behavior, yes, is actually irrelevant in technical steels. Even stage two, you barely see stage two. You see mostly stage three. So we need to understand what it is that causes this. So let's, let's, let's see, uh, describe stage one, stage two, and stage three, yes? And then not forget that the reason why we're doing this is because we're interested in stage three, because that's the stage that's actually relevant to steels in practice. So low strain hardening stage is one, again, it's a single crystal material. And here we have so it's only observed for uh, crystals that are oriented in single slip, yes? Of no practical importance, what you basically have is the dislocations are generated and move freely on glide planes. There's only one slip system. They don't encounter forest dislocations. They're not just, they're just not there, yes? So very low or no strain hardening. Stage two, what happens? You have a single crystal, it's oriented in single slip, you deform the material, and as you deform the material, down here, and so the single slip situation is like this. So say I, I, I use compression, yes, and in stage one, if we have more, of, more deformation in stage one, we get more slip, yes? So, so, so you can see here more and more strain in stage one, yes? However, note that if this is in a machine, yes, the axis of, the compression axis of the machine stays the same, right? But you can see that this single slip situation is only possible if the, if the lower part of the crystal moves sideways. But obviously the crystal doesn't do this, it's gripped there. So, and because it's gripped, hmm? yeah? because it's gripped, this has to be to remain in one line, yes? It means that the crystal starts to rotate, yes? There will be a, yeah, so I draw it differently here. But in this case, in case of compression here, yes? This part of the crystal starts to rotate, so, so this part comes back to where it's supposed to be in the machine, right? So you get crystal rotation. As you get crystal rotation, the conditions for single slip are not met anymore. And you get multiple slip systems are activated. So stage two, that's what you get. Multiple stage, yeah? and again, you observe it's a single crystal. When the initial orientation has changed due to crystal rotation. And stage two is characterized by very high strain hardening. And we see this in polycrystalline material, like in seals, but only in the initial stage of the deformation. And only if our initial dislocation density in that technical material in that steel is low enough, right? Hmm? And what happens here? This is a stage, this, this high uh, uh, strain hardening case. That's a stage in which the creation, yes, of dislocations, yes, generation, generation of dislocation is much larger than the rate at which we annihilate dislocations. And in three, stage three, we call softening stage, it's not 
the, the word softening has to be here very carefully. It doesn't mean that the strain hardening is negative. It's still positive, yes? But it increases at a lower rate, yes? Okay, it's not negative. It's, so don't understand softening as a decrease. In, it's not hardening as much, right? It's not, so decrease would be negative, right? It's not negative. Okay, so it's, but we call it softening. Okay. So it's softening in the sense that the strain hardening is lower than in stage two. The strain hardening has a more or less parabolic uh, dependence on the stress in this stage. And what happens at the microstructural level is important, and in particular for steels, is you get this, this lower strain hardening because of the cross-slip events. The dislocations start to run into obstacles, other dislocation, and they start to cross-slip, yes? They can do this because we have higher stresses which make this possible. And there is another thing that is important is the fact that we have a larger dislocation density. And this leads to dislocation annihilation. So the disappearance of dislocation. So as you create more uh, as you have a higher dislocation density, you will also get dislocation reactions that lead to removal of dislocations. For instance, if I have this dislocation is encountering this dislocation, you know, when they encounter each other, or I have this dislocation, encounters this dislocation. If they meet, no more dislocation. That is a typical dislocation annihilation process. Or I have one dislocation and another dislocation, and they come together and they form a third dislocation. Yes? One dislocation I, had, I used to have two dislocation lengths, yes? Now it's, so it, the, the density of dislocation has halved by the, so, and of course these processes are called processes of annihilation and they become more likely as you have a higher dislocation density. And this is the stage that's relevant to us and in state, and stage two, we can see a little bit of it at the low strains. And stage one is pretty much not relevant for, for technical steels. Um, yes? So let's, let's make the connection now with uh, uh, the, the, the strain hardening behavior of our single crystal with the strain hardening behavior of our polycrystalline material. This is a very familiar shape of a stress strain curve to you. And basically you have a yield point and then you deform the material, the, st the stress, uh, so, so here it's presented as shear stress as a function of shear uh, strain. Mm -hmm. This is this is a curve, yes? And you can see that if you plot the, uh, uh, the derivative to this curve, here it has a high value, yes? And here it has a, well, here it's in principle zero, right? It's flat in this case, all right? So I have an initial strain hardening and a final very low strain hardening. And in between, I have a continuous variation of the strain hardening. So if I plot this, yes, the derivative to this curve, as a function of the stress, I find a line, a straight line, that starts at the initial value for the strain hardening, and that coincides with the uh, yield point, or very close to the yield point, yes? and um, a value of saturation um, uh, strain hardening, which is close to zero in this case, 
at the at the saturation strain you want or at the uh, you know upper yield point uh, sorry um, ultimate tensile stress yes okay so very simple and the relation bit with uh, this polycrystalline hardening and the single crystal hardening is that is initially you'll see you may see a little bit of stage two yes but most of what you'll see is what you're seeing is stage three behavior in terms of um, polycrystalline behavior okay so, um, so let's just, I just have five minutes, it's good. I can introduce uh, the, uh, the math, the math behind uh, this approach of strain hardening. So we, we basically, when you deform um, a steel, um, you, know, you have in the grains, you have two groups of dislocations, yes? You have mobile dislocations and you have immobile dislocations. You can think of it as you have mobile dislocations that glide, yes, and the immobile dislocations are basically your forest dislocations, yes. Okay, and as you strain, yes, the density of these dislocations, mobile, immobile, will change, obviously increase. Right? So mobile, so. But there is a, bit, a little bit of a difference, and I already uh, mentioned this, yes? That as you strained, the evolution of the density of mobile and immobile dislocation was different, yes? So, immobile dislocation, when you deform, you have a steady increase of uh, their amount. So, what, what we say is we store dislocations. We store dislocations. Hmm? However, the density of the mobile dislocation doesn't change very much. And in fact, uh, considering the big difference, we can, assume, we can assume that the immobile dislocation is pretty much constant. Uh, uh, no. Mobile dislocation density is pretty much constant. So this is pretty much flat compared to this. Um, now, now, this is actually like that. If you do the measurements, it's actually like that, yes, in practice. So, the evolution, the change, the change in the dislocation, uh, so the change in the dislocation density is, as it, with strain, is mobile dislocation density plus immobile dislocation density, because this is so small, right, it's not zero, you're basically looking at the immobile or forest dislocation uh, accumulation. Hmm? Okay, right. Now, if you look at the, now, just thinking about dislocations, yes, there are always two competing processes, yes, in the change of the dislocation density. One is a creation, you, with strain you create dislocations, and with strain you also remove dislocations. So you have, so you have a rate equation here. This dislocation density changes with strain, yes, and the change is the result of a creation of dislocation uh, and a annihilation of dislocation. So multiplication or generation and annihilation, yes? And how does that happen? Well, you have dislocation sources, you know, dislocation, they generate Mobile dislocations, obviously, they don't generate immobile dislocations. They generate mobile dislocations. These mobile dislocations move for a while, and then they get stuck on obstacles. They may pass these obstacles, yes? But eventually, they will become immobile dislocations. So that's important. The, the, 
the, the, the, the immobile dislocation used to be mobile dislocations. And you basically increase the density of forest dislocation just by adding mobile dislocations that run into forest dislocations and get stuck, cannot move anymore. And they, they were mobile dislocations and they now are forest dislocations. Yes? So that's how it works. Hmm? So the increase of the dislocation density is due to accumulation of immobile dislocations. And these immobile dislocations are nothing else than arrested mobile dislocations at strong obstacles. Yes? That's basically... So that we'll, we'll see how on, on, on Thursday how uh, we work out the theory and how we can apply this theory to basically obtain stress-strain curve in, um, in steels um, by just uh, finding ways to compute or describe the, the change in or evolution in dislocation density. Okay. All right, so thank you very much for your uh, attention. Sorry about the hiccup at the start, but uh, I had the wrong file.